Chapter thirty one of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ty Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty one. A greater loss. It was not difficult for me, on Peggotty's solicitation, to resolve to stay where I was until after the remains of the poor carrier should have made their last journey to Blunderstone. She had long ago bought, out of her own savings, a little piece of ground in her old churchyard near the grave of her sweet little girl, as she always called my mother, and there they were laid to rest. In keeping Peggotty company and doing all I could for her, little enough at the utmost, I was as grateful, I rejoice to think, as even now I could wish myself to have been. But I am afraid I had a supreme satisfaction of a personal and professional nature in taking charge of Mr. Barkis's will and expounding its contents. I may claim the merit of having originated the suggestion that the will should be looked for in the box. After some search it was found in the box, at the bottom of a horse's nose-bag, wherein, besides hay, there was discovered an old gold watch, with chain and seals, which Mr. Barkis had worn on his wedding day, which had never been seen before or since, a silver tobacco-stopper in the form of a leg an imitation lemon full of minute cups and saucers which i have some idea mr barkis must have purchased to present to me when i was a child and afterwards found himself unable to part with eighty-seven guineas and a half in guineas and half guineas two hundred and ten pounds in perfectly clean bank-notes certain receipts for bank of england stock an old horseshoe a bad shilling a piece of camphor and an oyster-shell from the circumstance of the latter article having been much polished and displaying prismatic colours on the inside i conclude that mr barkis had some general ideas about pearls which never resolved themselves into anything definite for years and years mr barkis had carried this box on all his journeys every day that it might the better escape notice he had invented a fiction that it belonged to mr black boy and was to be left with barkis till called for a fable which he had elaborately written on the lid in characters now scarcely legible he had hoarded all these years i found to good purpose his property and money amounted to nearly three thousand pounds of this he bequeathed the interest of one thousand pounds to mr peggotty for his life and on his decease the principal to be equally divided between peggotty little emily and me or the survivor or survivors of us share and share alike all the rest he died possessed of he bequeathed to peggotty whom he left residuary legatee and sole executrix of that his last will and testament I felt myself quite a proctor when I read this document aloud with all possible ceremony, and set forth its provisions any number of times to those whom they concerned. I began to think that there was more in the commons than I had supposed. I examined the will with the deepest attention, pronounced it perfectly formal in all respects, made a pencil mark or two in the margin, and thought it rather extraordinary that I knew so much. In this abstruse pursuit, in making an account for Peggotty of all the property into which she had come, in arranging all the affairs in an orderly manner, and in being her referee and adviser on every point, to our joint delight, I passed a week before the funeral. I did not see little Emily in that interval, but they told me she was to be quietly married in a fortnight. I did not attend the funeral in character, if I may venture to say so. I mean I was not dressed up in a black coat and a streamer to frighten the birds, but I walked over to Blunderstone early in the morning, and was in the churchyard when it came, attended only by Peggotty and her brother. The mad gentleman looked on out of my little window, Mr. Chillip's baby wagged its heavy head, and rolled its goggle eyes at the clergyman over its nurse's shoulder. Mr. Omer breathed short in the background, no one else was there, and it was very quiet. We walked about the churchyard for an hour after all was over, and pulled some young leaves from the tree above my mother's grave. A dread falls on me here, a cloud is lowering on the distant town, towards which I retraced my solitary steps. I fear to approach it. I cannot bear to think of what did come upon that memorable night, of what must come again if I go on. It is no worse because I write of it. It would be no better if I stopped my most unwilling hand. It is done. Nothing can undo it. Nothing can make it otherwise than it was. My old nurse was to go to London with me next day on the business of the will. Little Emily was passing that day at Mr. Omer's. We were all to meet in the old boat-house that night. 
Ham would bring Emily at the usual hour, I would walk back at my leisure, the brother and sister would return as they had come, and be expecting us when the day had closed in at the fireside. I parted from them at the wicked gate where visionary strap had rested with Roderick Random's knapsack in the days of yore, and, instead of going straight back, walked a little distance on the road to Lowestoft. Then I turned and walked back towards Yarmouth. I stayed to dine at a decent ale-house, some mile or two from the ferry I had mentioned before, and thus the day wore away, and it was evening when I reached it. The rain was falling heavily by that time, and it was a wild night, but there was a moon behind the clouds, and it was not dark. I was soon within sight of Mr. Peggotty's house, and of the light within it shining through the window. A little floundering across the sand, which was heavy, brought me to the door, and I went in. It looked very comfortable indeed. Mr. Peggotty had smoked his evening pipe, and there were preparations for some supper by and by. The fire was bright, the ashes were thrown up, the locker was ready for little Emily in her old place. In her old place sat Peggotty once more, looking, but for her dress, as if she had never left it. She had fallen back already on the society of the workbox with St. Paul's upon the lid, the yard measure in the cottage, and the bit of wax candle, and there they all were, just as if they had never been disturbed. Mrs. Gummidge appeared to be fretting a little in her old corner, and consequently looked quite natural too. "'You're first in the lot, Master Davy,' said Mr. Peggotty, with a happy face. "'Don't keep in that coat, sir, if it's wet.' "'Thank you, Mr. Peggotty,' said I, giving him my outer coat to hang up. "'It's quite dry.' "'So tis,' said Mr. Peggotty, feeling my shoulders, "'as a chip. See ye down, sir. It ain't a no use saying welcome to you, but you're welcome, kind and hearty.' "'Thank you, Mr. Peggotty. I am sure of that.' "'Well, Peggotty,' said I, giving her a kiss, "'and how are you, old woman?' "'Ha, <laughs> ha!' laughed Mr. Peggotty, sitting down beside us, and rubbing his hands in his sense of relief from recent trouble, and in the genuine heartiness of his nature. "'There's not a woman in the world, sir, as I tell her, that need to feel more easy in her mind than her. She's done her duty by the departed, and the departed knowed it, and the departed done what was right by her, as she done what was right by the departed, and, and, and it's all right.' Mrs. Gummidge groaned. "'Cheer up, my pretty mother, said Mr. Peggotty, but he shook his head aside at us, evidently sensible of the tendency of the late occurrences to recall the memory of the old one. "'Don't be down. Cheer up, for your own self. Only a little bit, and see if a good deal more don't come natural.' "'Not to me, Dan'l,' returned Mrs. Gummidge. "'Nothing's natural to me but to be lone and lorn.' "'No, no,' said Mr. Peggotty, soothing her sorrows. "'Yes, yes, Dan'l,' said Mrs. Gummidge. "'I ain't a person to live with them as has had money left. Things go contrary with me. I had better be a riddance.' "'Why, how should I ever spend it without you?' said Mr. Peggotty, with an air of serious remonstrance. "'What are you a-talking on? Don't I want you more now than I ever did?' "'I know there was never wanted before.' cried Mrs. Gummidge, with a pitiable whimper. "'And now I'm told so. How could I expect to be wanted, being so lone and lorn and so contrary?' Mr. Peggotty seemed very much shocked at himself for having made a speech capable of this unfeeling construction, but was prevented from replying by Peggotty's pulling his sleeve and shaking her head. After looking at Mrs. Gummidge for some moments, in sore distress of mind, he glanced at the Dutch clock, rose, snuffed the candle, and put it in the window. "'There,' said Mr. Peggotty cheerily, "'there we are, Mrs. Gummidge.' Mrs. Gummidge slightly groaned. "'Light it up according to custom. You're a wonder what's that for, sir. Well, tis for our little Emily. You see, the path ain't over light or cheerful after dark. And when I'm here at the hour and she's a-coming home, I puts a light in the winder. That, you see, said Mr. Peggotty, bending over me with great glee, meets two objects. She says, says Emily, there's home, she says. And likewise, says Emily, my uncle's there, for if I ain't there, I never have no light showed. You're a baby, said Peggotty, very fond of him for it, if she thought so. Well, returned Mr. Peggotty, standing with his legs pretty wide apart, and rubbing his hands up and down them in his comfortable satisfaction, as he looked alternately at us and at the fire. I don't know but I am, not you see to look at. 
not exactly observed peggotty no laughed mr peggotty not to look at but to to consider on you know i don't care bless you now i tell you when i go a-looking and a-looking about that there pretty house of our emily's i'm i'm gormed said mr peggotty with sudden emphasis there i can't say more if i don't feel as if the littlest of things was her almost i takes em up and i puts em down and i touches of em as delicate as if they was our emily so tis with her little bonnets and that i couldn't see one on em rough use on purpose not for the whole world there's a babby for you in the form of a grey sea porcupine said mr peggotty relieving his earnestness with a roar of laughter peggotty and i both laughed but not so loud it's my opinion you see said mr peggotty with a delighted face after some further rubbing of his legs as this is along o my havin played with her so much and may believe as we was turks and french and sharks and every variety of foreigners bless ye yes and lions and whales and i don't know what all when she warn't no higher than my knee and i got into the way on it you know why this here candle now said mr peggotty gleefully holding out his hand towards it i know very well that after she's married and gone i shall put that candle there just the same as now i know very well that when i'm here o' nights and where else should i live bless your hearts whatever fortune i come into and she ain't here or i ain't there i shall put the candle in the winder and sit afore the fire pretending i'm expecting of her like i'm a-doing now there's a babby for you said mr peggotty with another roar in the form of a sea porcupine why at the present minute when i see the candle sparkle up i says to myself she's a looking at it emily's a coming there's a babby for you in the form of a sea porcupine right for all that said mr peggotty stopping in his roar and smiting his hands together for here she is it was only ham the night should have turned more wet since i came in for he had a large sou'wester hat on slouched over his face where's emily said mr peggotty ham made a motion with his head as if she were outside mr peggotty took the light from the window trimmed it put it on the table and was busily stirring the fire when ham who had not moved said master davy will you come out a minute and see what emily and me has got to show you we went out as i passed him at the door i saw to my astonishment and fright that he was deathly pale he pushed me hastily into the open air and closed the door upon us only upon us too ham what's the matter oh master davy oh for his broken heart how dreadfully he wept i was paralysed by the sight of such grief i don't know what i thought or what i dreaded i could only look at him ham poor good fellow for heaven's sake tell me what's the matter my love master davy the pride and hope of my heart her that i'd have died for that i would die for now she's gone gone emily's run away oh master davy think how she's run away when i pray my good and gracious god to kill her her that is so dear above all things sooner than let her come to ruin and disgrace the face he turned up to the troubled sky the quivering of his clasped hands the agony of his figure remain associated with that lonely waste in my remembrance to this hour it is always night there and he is the only object in the scene you are a scholar he said hurriedly and know what's right and best what am i to say indoors how am i ever to break it to him master davy i saw the door move and instinctively tried to hold the latch on the outside to gain a moment's time it was too late mr peggotty thrust forth his face and never could i forget the change that came upon it when he saw us if i were to live five hundred years i remember a great wail and cry and the women hanging about him and we all standing in the room i with a paper in my hand which ham had given me mr peggotty with his vest torn open his hair wild his face and lips quite white and blood trickling down his bosom it had sprung from his mouth i think looking fixedly at me read it sir he said in a low shivering voice so please i don't know as i can understand in the midst of the silence of death i read thus from a blotted letter when you who love me so much better than i ever deserved even when my mind was innocent see this i shall be far away i shall be far away he repeated slowly stop emily far away well 
when i leave my dear home my dear home oh my dear home in the morning the letter bore date on the previous night it will be never to come back unless he brings me back a lady this will be found at night many hours after instead of me oh if you only knew how my heart is torn if even you that i have wronged so much that never can forgive me could only know what i suffer i am too wicked to write about myself oh take comfort in thinking that i am so bad oh for mercy's sake tell uncle that i never loved him half so dear as now oh don't remember how affectionate and kind you have all been to me don't remember we were ever to be married but try to think as if i died when i was little and was buried somewhere pray heaven that i am going away from have compassion upon my uncle tell him that i never loved him half so dear be his comfort love some good girl that will be what i was once to uncle and be true to you and worthy of you and know no shame but me god bless all i'll pray for all often on my knees if he don't bring me back a lady and i don't pray for myself i'll pray for all my parting love to uncle my last tears my last thanks for uncle that was all he stood long after i had ceased to read still looking at me at length i ventured to take his hand and to entreat him as well as i could to endeavour to get some command of himself he replied i thank ye sir i thank ye without moving ham spoke to him mr peggotty was so far sensible of his affliction that he wrung his hand but otherwise he remained in the same state and no one dared to disturb him slowly at last he moved his eyes from my face as if he were waking from a vision and cast them around the room then he said in a low voice who's the man i want to know his name ham glanced at me and suddenly i felt a shock that struck me back there's a man suspected said mr peggotty who is it master davy implored ham go out a bit and let me tell him what i must you do and ought to hear it sir i felt the shock again i sank down in a chair and tried to utter some reply but my tongue was fettered and my sight was weak i want to know his name i heard said once more for some time past ham faltered there's been a servant about here at odd times there's been a gentleman too both of them belong to one another mr peggotty stood fixed as before but now looking at him the servant pursued ham was seen along with our poor girl last night he's been in hiding about here this week or over he was thought to have gone but he was hiding don't stay master davy don't i felt peggotty's arm around my neck but i could not have moved if the house had been about to fall upon me a strange shay and horses was outside town this morning on the norwich road almost afore day broke ham went on the servant went to it and came from it and went to it again when he went to it again emily was nigh him t'other was inside he's the man for the lord's love said mr peggotty falling back and putting out his hand as if to keep off what he dreaded don't tell me his name steerforth master davy exclaimed ham in a broken voice it ain't no fault of yourn and i am far from laying of it to you but his name is steerforth and he's a damned villain Mr. Peggotty uttered no cry, and shed no tear, and moved no more, until he seemed to wake again all at once, and pulled down his rough coat from its peg in a corner. "'Bear a hand with this. I'm struck of a heap, and I can't do it,' he said impatiently. "'Bear a hand and help me. Well, when somebody had done so, now give me that there hat.' Ham asked him whether he was going. "'I'm a-going to seat my niece. I'm a-going to seat my Emily.' i'm a goin first to stave that there boat and sink it where i would a drowned at him as i'm a livin soul if i had had one thought of what was in him as he sat afore me he said wildly holding out his clenched right hand as he sat afore me face to face strike me down dead but i'd have drowned him and thought it right i'm a goin to seek my niece where cried ham interposing himself before the door anywhere i'm a-going to seek my niece through the world i'm a-going to find my poor niece in her shame and bring her back no one stop me i tell you i'm a-going to seek my niece no no 
cried Mrs. Gummidge, coming between them in a fit of crying. No, no, Dan'l, not as you are now. Seek her in a little while, my lone lorn Dan'l, and that'll be but right, but not as you are now. Sit ye down and give me your forgiveness for having ever been a worry to you. Dan'l, what of my contraries ever been to this? And let us speak a word about them times when she was first an orphan, and when Ham was too, and when I was a poor widow woman and you took me in. It'll soften your poor heart, Dan'l, laying her head upon his shoulder. And you'll bear your sorrow better, for you know the promise, Dan'l. As you have done it unto one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. And that can never fail under this roof that's been our shelter for so many, many year. He was quite passive now, and when I heard him crying, the impulse that had been upon me to go down upon my knees, and ask their pardon for the desolation I had caused, and curse Steerforth, yielded to a better feeling. My overcharged heart found the same relief, and I cried too. End of chapter 31